nanohub.org. Okay. So this is our last session in this uh, training session. Those of you that were here when we started uh, yesterday, you'll recall that I mentioned there was three fundamental measurement types that are needed for any device or material, material characterization, and that is precision DCIV, AC impedance or CV, and the third type is, is ultra-fast IV or transient testing. Now really there's a fourth type and that's continuous wave RF testing, but we're not covering that in this seminar. So even though we are doing this uh, seminar as a Purdue training session, uh, Purdue does not yet have um, the, this transient IV capability, but we wanted to include it in the training session. So what exactly is ultra-fast IV? <laughs> Well, ultra-fast IV is sort of by definition short pulses or transitions between pulses. And when we say short, we, may, we mean less than, say, 10 microseconds. And that's short compared to a traditional DC IV instrument, which operates in milliseconds. So we can do multiple multi-level waveforms, and we can do high-speed measurements while pulsing and we'll describe why that's different than what we did before. Briefly, the ultra-fast IV hardware is a plug-in module for the Model 4200 uh, mainframe. It's a single card slot module, which actually has two complete channels on it, and it has, optionally, two remote amplifiers for giving you a very low current capability right out at your device pins. Um, each channel is completely independent or completely fully synchronized. Um, <clears throat> you can put up to four of these modules in one chassis, giving you eight synchronized channels. This um, provides pulses or voltage capability from millivolts up to 40 volts. That's 40 volts into high impedance. And it has pulse widths from 60 nanoseconds with measurement or 20 nanoseconds without. Um, up to about a second. The uh, control timing parameters we give you access to include pulse delay, pulse width, rise time, fall time, pulse period, and really pretty much any other parameter you could imagine. Now, some people like to sort of envision this as a pulse generator, and indeed it is. It's a pulse generator. It makes nice pulses. But really what it is, <laughs> is it's an ultra-fast IV source. It is not limited to pulses. It can slew voltage at the rate of about a volt per microsecond, and it has a very fast digital engine that allows you to create arbitrary waveforms. So I don't, I'm not limited to pulsing. <clears throat> the other unique aspect of it is that it actually digitizes both the voltage and the current, and that's the unique aspect. It has current amplifiers in it that are currently faster and lower noise than anything commercially available on the market. Now, what we discovered as we were developing this instrument over the last several years is that when you have a pulsed IV system that's measuring current, one of the things that it does is it measures the current that charges up the cable. And since these systems are actually used on a probe station, we always have to have a cable on there. So we devised uh, something that we call the remote amplifier switch. And what this really is, is a signal conditioning current amplifier. And it can melt very close to the probe tips, meaning we can get very short cables with very low capacitance. So this is really a low current amplifier intended to deal with low current measurements that happen very quickly. And it is, it is optional. The instrument will work with or without this low current amplifier. This low current amplifier is not a standalone amplifier. It will only work with the PMU module. And at the request of several people, we added a, actually a mini switch matrix in here. So you can actually connect your source measure units, your CV instrument, and your ultra-fast instrument all into this remote amplifier. So now you can do IV, CV, and pulsed IV, your transient measurements at your probes without changing the cables, without changing the instrument. It's all done within the graphical user interface. Now, this is sort of a block diagram. What does this instrument do? What is it really? What it really is, is it's two complete channels that are both independent and or synchronized. Each channel has a very fast, high-speed voltage source. This voltage source is capable of plus and minus 40 volts. 
Um, in fact, if you go out in the market and look for a 40 volt pulse generator, you'll have a hard time finding one. Most pulse generators think about 10 volts is what they can do. This is actually a 40 volt source limited by 50 ohm output impedance. So like a pulse generator, it has a 50 ohm output impedance. But then we put our very high speed current amplifiers and voltage amplifiers in there. And we tied a 14 bit, 200 megahertz digitizer to each of these. So each has its own digitizer. And then uh, that, that just comes out of this channel one output here. And we have a completely second channel here, which is a mirror image of the first channel. It's got a full 40 volt source. It's got full uh, voltage and current amplifiers. And it has two of its own 14 bit, 200 megahertz A to D converters. <coughs> so actually this instrument has four 14 bit, 200 megahertz A to D converters. You would be hard pressed to actually find a state of the art oscilloscope that actually has that much A to D conversion power at 14 bits. And then we backed all this up with a very powerful DSP based control and data acquisition engine. There's actually multiple DSP chips in here and very deep memory. Each channel has a gigabyte of its own memory, and this memory is full speed memory. In other words, the A to D converters can, at five nanoseconds, continuously put the data into that memory. Um, also, because you specifically asked, we do have a trigger input and output port on this, which allows you to access to the digital control circuitry to synchronize this instrumentation with external uh, events. Does the trigger out start when it's just started measuring or when it starts the process to start measuring? <laughs> so the, the question for the microphone, the question is, when does the trigger out actually occur? Um, you finally stumped me. I actually can't answer that. <laughs> I don't know exactly, I don't know the exact timing of the trigger in and trigger out capability on this new instrument. So I wanted to give some examples because ultrafast IV, this is a new class of instrument. People aren't quite sure yet how to use it. So these examples were intended to sort of spark your imagination. It really is not everything the unit can do, but these are areas that it's found application in already. This is what we call single pulse charge trapping on high K dielectrics. As high K dielectrics were being developed, um, they realized that there was a lot of charge trapping that went on in these different dielectrics. And the uh, technique was devised called single pulse charge trapping, which would allow you to characterize the trapping detrapping characteristics of IK dielectrics. But that required rise times in the 100 nanosecond range and the ability to measure currents as low as about 100 nanoamps or so. So this required some new instrumentation to be able to do this characterization technique. Um, Silicon on insulator is a relatively uh, new uh, technology where the uh, uh, all the transistors or the entire chip is built on top of an insulating layer. This gives you very high isolation, very low parasitics, and you can actually get a much higher performance chip out of this, right? But the problem is silicon dioxide doesn't dissipate heat very well. So these transistors are very sensitive to continuous power and they needed to be characterized in a pulsed mode. So we came up with the pulsed IV capability, which is uh, analogous to standard IV, but we do it with pulses, allowing a long duty cycle, which means that the parts can cool down between measurements. And this required something in the neighborhood of 100 nanosecond rise times with 10 nanoamps sort of capability. Um, LDMOS and gallium arsenide has the same self-heating problem. Flash memory and its new derivatives. There is a variety of new materials out there, generically called memristors, that are potentially um, replacements for flash memory. And flash memory itself also needs pulse characterization, um, phase change memory, resistive memory, and some of the new spin memory. They all need pulse style characterization. Um, here's phase change memory. 
Ultrafast NBTI stands for Negative Bias Temperature Instability. This is a reliability issue on CMOS shrink. Once uh, devices got below almost probably 90 or 65 nanometers, they discovered a reliability issue called bias temperature instability. And so to measure some of the characteristics of this bias temperature instability, you need some response times of say 50 nanoseconds and maybe 2 nanoamp kind of capability. Of course, there's thermal impedance, random telegraph signals. This is something that shows up in CCD cameras in particular, but it's really just a, another form of noise. And of course, charge-based uh, capacitance measurements. So the, the, the point is there's a variety of characterization techniques on a variety of different materials and devices and processes that require things in the nanosecond range and currents in the nanoamp and microamp range. This capability wasn't available previously. So really, what's the difference between the Keithley's traditional precision model 4200 SMU and a model 4225 PMU? Well, a DCIV or precision SMU is accuracy and precision is the priority. The system is tuned to make sure it's settled, make sure the noise is low, make sure everything is really nice before it makes a measurement. The voltage and current conditions are held very precisely. We delay things in the system until things reach equilibrium, and then we measure with very long integration times to maximize accuracies and precisions. So a precision IV source, it's not uncommon to have 0.01% sort of traceable accuracy. But with the ultra-fast IV, the priority is deterministic timing. What we really are more concerned with is when does the voltage and current measurements occur and is as opposed to or is everything settled and everything accurate. So we force the timing instead of allowing the instrument to select the timing like we do with an SMU. Um, we do um, measure sequences um, in lockstep with the force sequences so that we do know when we force and measure exactly what's going on, but it's timing centric. So the precisions that we get, excuse, excuse me, are often in the range of 1% or maybe 0.1% as opposed to a 0.01% with an ultra fast IV. This is it's actually a very fun chart. Um, this is sort of a chart that describes, let's call it current sensitivity or current noise versus measurement time or measurement rate. So if you look at a traditional source measure unit, which runs from about an amp down to, I don't know, 10 picoamps, unless you add an optional preamp and then it runs down to 0 0.01 femtoamp, Right? This is the range of current that that precision SMU can measure, and its best case is somewhere here in the neighborhood of about 10 milliseconds or so. Yeah, my, my chart axis is off a little bit, <laughs> but it's about 10 milliseconds or so. But the ultra-fast IV picks up there and comes on out here. So it runs a little less than an amp and down to, I don't know, in the neighborhood of 100 nanoamps or less, maybe down even to one nanoamp. Okay, but you see that its speeds extend all the way out here to 10 nanosecond type of speeds. And then if we add the optional remote amplifier, you see we extend the low current capability significantly lower than the traditional instrument. So what we've added is we've added a whole realm of measurement here that simply wasn't available before. Simply couldn't get there before. Now, I always like to point out that you know there are fundamental limits to what you can measure. And so what we did is we drew a Johnson noise limit um, line down here, which basically Johnson noise limits are thermally generated, self-generated noise in devices and materials. And it depends on the temperature of the material and the resistance of the device and the bandwidth of what you're looking at. So the Johnson noise line actually will move around with temperature and bandwidth and resistance. But we picked a temperature and a bandwidth and a resistance and we drew a, a Johnson noise line on here. So this is a th theoretical limit. You can't measure down here. Measurements don't exist down here. Johnson noise 
will say, um, because of this, you can't measure down here. Now, the only way you can get around that is to lower the temperature. So you'll see people go into cryo chambers and things, and that will lower the Johnson noise, or change the bandwidth. But changing the bandwidth changes my measurement time. So frequently what we'll see is we'll see people ask us, well, I want to measure a picoamp in 100 nanoseconds. So we can come to this and say, well, picoamp in 100 nanoseconds resides right here. I'm sorry that measurement's impossible. It's amazing how many people actually argue with me. They come back and say, well, yeah, but I have to do it. Can't you find a way to do it? You know, and I have to come back and explain, you need to th rethink your test methodology. The data that you're trying to take doesn't exist. All right. And then you explain Johnson noise limits. You show them the equations and they go, oh, yes. Okay. What I'm trying to do is impossible. All right. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about pulsed voltage or pulsed IV. So we have had to create sort of a new standard for pulse terminology because pulsed IV is different than a pulse generator. So what we said is um, we have two voltages to define a standard two level pulse. We have two source ranges. We have a 10 volt range and a 40 volt range. Okay. And what this results in is a potential between two units of something that could run between 20 and 80 volts. So what does this mean? Well, this means I've got two sources that are synchronized. I could have one on the top of my device and go to plus 40 volts. I could have one on the bottom of the device and have it go simultaneously to minus 40 volts. I could have an 80 volt differential across my sample. All right. So we define what we call the base voltage and then the amplitude of the pulse. And so our base can sit anywhere that a single unit can sit. And then the amplitude is a differential potential from where one channel sitting versus what the other channel could do. So we could have base amplitudes that run up to 80 volts and differentials that run, sorry, bases that run 40 volts and differentials that run up to 80 volts. Now we also had to redefine a little bit what it means by pulse width. So pulse width um, for our purpose is calculated at 50% amplitude. It's what we call a full width at half maximum. So pulse width to us is here to here. So many times on a pulse generator, they may define it differently, but for our purposes, this is how we define it. So our pulse width capability is 60 nanoseconds on a 10 volt range and 140 nanoseconds on the uh, 40 volt range. And we can extend that pulse width all the way out to a second. Now the pulse period is by our definition, the total time that we're not in the pulse width. So that could include some pre time and some post time. So our pulse period runs 120 nanoseconds for a 10 volt range and 280 nanoseconds for a 40 volt range. So pulse timing also required some more definitions. We, we define the rise time here as zero to 100%. Industry standard for pulse generators is usually 10 to 90%. But remember, we're doing pulsed IV. We really want to know when it gets here and when it takes off. So we defined rise time as, as um, zero to 100%. And then uh, we have what we call our pulse top time and our pulse base time, which is down here. So the sort of rise time that we're capable of when we're making measurements is about 20 nanoseconds on a 10 volt range and 100 nanoseconds on a 40 volt range. But that's when we're making measurements. If we're just acting as a voltage source, we can actually get 10 nanoseconds here and under 50 nanoseconds here. So duty cycle is pulse width divided by the total period. It's the amount of time that the pulse is on at full width half max. And just for an example, an isothermal test, in other words, where I allow a sample to cool off before I hit it again, is typically 5%. So if we had a 
100 nanosecond pulse width at 5% duty cycle. That would give us a uh, 10 microsecond, sorry, 50 microsecond total period. Oh, I actually have it down here. <laughs> That's a 10% period. So what do we mean when we say pulsed IV? So here's an example, the difference between pulsed IV and DC IV. With DC IV, we step the voltage, we wait till it settles, and we make a measurement, and we plot it. And then we step the voltage, make a measurement, and plot it, leaving the voltage turned on for this entire period of time. So there's actually energy applied, and electric field applied to our sample continuously. But with pulsed IV, we do something different. We turn the voltage on, and then we make the measurement, and then we turn the voltage back off again. Now, when we make this measurement right here, we've defined a new term for that measurement time. We call that a spot mean. So what that means is we actually pick one spot at the top of our pulse, and because we're using a five nanosecond digitizer, we take as many samples as the person requires, and then we mean them together and give you one result. So we pick a spot and then we do a mean of multiple samples, but we only return one current, one result for that. Notice we don't return the results when the pulse is turned off. So what this allows us to do is recreate the DC curve, but we recreate it in a thermally controlled environment. Yeah? Uh, do you have any specifications for ringing, like on top of the pulse? Okay. So the, the question is, is there any specifications for ringing? And the answer is this. The instrument, when properly cabled and terminated, does not ring. So we have defined the damping of the instrument within the parameters that we can do that we are not over damped or under damped, we're critically damped. However, depending on how you cable it and terminate it, now you can start to get ringing out of it. But, but it's very important to understand we, we have what we call an overshoot spec, and our overshoot spec is, can't remember it off the top of my head, but I think it's in the neighborhood of 1%. And that's a very critical element, and it's unique to this instrument. It's much better than pulse generators. And the reason is we designed this to be able to test some of the new memory technologies. And things like flash memories with very thin uh, dielectrics cannot stand overshoot. You actually begin to break down the, the dielectrics and begin to damage the device. So this is designed to have the minimum overshoot possible and yet still maintain the characteristics. So we actually have sort of two modes that we support in our standard graphical user interface. One is what we call the two-level pulse mode. That's just pulsing from a base to some sweeping level. That's pulse IV. But we also have full ARB capability. We have full ARB capability and we have what we call segment ARB capability. Now what we discovered is that many of these custom waveforms that people want to do can actually be described as a series of line segments. These are really line segments that are strung together. So instead of uh, with an ARB, you have to program every point of the waveform that you want. We created the ability to string together line segments, and then you can make uh, measurements based on <clears throat> these line segments. So you see, we're not limited to pulsing. We are a full, fast, ultra-fast IV. So we have two types of measurements. We have the spot mean that I've already described. The spot mean is where we pick a spot on our waveform, usually on the pulse. We take as many samples as defined. We mean them together and we return that as one measurement. All right. But we also have sampling mode. This is used for waveform capture. In sampling mode, we turn on both the voltage and current A to D converters, and then we start whipping the voltage around wherever we want it. So we're actually looking at the voltage and current as it's moving around, maybe with 10 nanosecond edges. Okay, And we wind up getting that whole set of data back. 
This is that unique, really unique capability this instrument brings. This unlocks the ability to look at transient phenomena and see stuff moving and going on that you haven't been able to see before. Now, because of the speed of our A to D converters, and because of things like noise, Johnson noise, one ref noise, <laughs> thermal noise, pink noise, shot noise, um, we do need some ability to try to do some averaging. So we've come up with ways to maintain the time integrity and yet give you some averaging to lower, to lower the noise. Usually that means making multiple pulses, taking a spot mean on each one, averaging them all together and returning that as one result. Oh, which is exactly what I show in my next slide. <laughs> so if you were to think about this, this is really just one voltage here, steps up one voltage, steps up one voltage, but we actually did multiple pulses so we could do multiple spot means while maintaining the duty cycle and then we average them all together so that we get an ultimately a lower noise result. So when we're doing the sampling mode or the sample measurement, we use this for waveform capture, for instrument and test system setup and verification, for pulse shape validation, for transient IV testing, and other time-solved reliability testing. So this provides a signal versus time with a maximum sample rate of 200 mega samples per second. That's once every five nanoseconds. And that is adjustable down to one kilo sample per second. That's about as slow as we can go, right? And we can do that with a standard pulse shown here digitized, or we can do that with a segmented ARB. Some waveform that we created by just stringing together a list of line segments. Now our segment ARB actually gives you the ability at each segment to define whether you want a spot mean at the segment or whether you want to digitize the entire segment. So you can create some really unique waveforms and data acquisitions here. So our two level pulse is used for pulsed IV and we can do a waveform capture on that pulse. Our segment ARB is used for things like non-volatile memory or ultra-fast reliability testing, and we can either spot mean or capture the entire transient. Now, here's some other common pulse tests, and we actually differenti differentiated these tests from the previous tests because in traditional charge pumping or flash testing, you don't actually measure the current. All you really need is a pulse generator and maybe a DC ammeter to perform these tests. But because we also operate like a pulse generator, we can do charge pumping and flash memory tests. Just as a brief refresher, charge pumping basically says, I'm going to put a pulse on the gate of my transistor and, and I will have charges filling traps either from the drain source or from the substrate depending on which direction my pulse is going. What that gives me is a rectified current coming out that my source measure unit can measure that is proportional to the number of interface states in this MOSFET. It's a very sensitive to interface states. On the other hand, flash memory uses a pulser to program and erase the flash memory, but it uses a traditional source measure unit to actually measure the characteristics. For example, flash memory has a limited lifetime, I don't know, 100,000 cycles. You can write and erase a flash memory before it dies. And so what we do is we write and erase the flash memory and then we measure its threshold and we see how close it is getting to dying. It's a lifetime endurance test. Now, one of the unique things we did is we took this ultra fast IV and we put it in our standard graphical user interface. Um, this is what we call our KITE software, Keithley Interactive, uh, Interactive Test Environment. And it, this test is our ITM, Interactive Test Module. And this ITM is simply nothing more than a point and shoot graphical user interface. There's no programming here. But we made this interface actually fit with pulsed IV and transient IV. 
Now, because Pulsed IV and Transient IV has so much more capability than traditional IV or CV, there's a limited number of things we can do in this graphical user interface. So it is very important to be able to also do low level programming and control and we give a full set of libraries for doing low level programming and control of this instrument. So I'm going to do a quick introduction to transient pulse analysis. The pulse shape determines the spot mean value for the pulse IV curve. In other words, if I'm doing pulsed IV, what I'm saying is I've got to wait until I'm at a point in my pulse shape to where I'm at a stable measurement point to do my stop spot mean. If I, especially if I want to corroborate this with some other DC IV technique. So what we're going to do is an introduction to current charging effects. So my goal here is to be able to do a pulse IV measurement on a device where I'm actually measuring the current and voltage at a stable point in the pulse. But I don't actually have knowledge ahead of time where that stable point is. That stable point probably uh, is dependent on cabling and uh, probe stations and things like that. So <clears throat> what I can do is I can run a waveform capture to characterize my system. The waveform capture shows that I get a large charging transient and a large discharging transient. And this is a nice stable point which hits at about 220 nanoseconds after the start of the pulse. Actually, this pulse starts at 100 nanoseconds at 220 or 120 nanoseconds after I have a stable point. So by using this transient capture capability, I can say I know my system needs roughly 120 nanoseconds for me to reach a stable point. And so now I know I have to go in and give it at least 120 nanosecond pulse width in my pulsed IV. So if I am begin making this current or this voltage measurement and I'm sitting somewhere here or worse, somewhere here during the transient portion of the curve, I'm actually getting relatively unpredictable results. In fact, by definition, the spot mean is intended to be at a fixed known result location. Here's an example of a transient settling time on it on a device which shows at three microseconds it's still settling but by eight microseconds it's pretty much fully settled. So if I run a 10 nanosecond pulsed IV curve it matches up with what you can barely see, the purple curve underneath, which is the DC curve. But if I ran a pulsed IV that had 150 nanosecond pulse widths, it's actually measuring way back here, which is an unsettled portion of my curve. Well, maybe that's the data I want. I don't know. It depends on what I want. So, you know, I just, the key here is I need to know, I need to define what it is I think I'm measuring, and I need to be aware that I now have a tool that can actually measure things that used to be hidden from me. So here's an example of a pulse measure unit. This is a very simple electrical model. Pulsar, 50 ohm, ammeter, voltmeter. Through a cable, through the device under test, notice that we pulse on the center pin of the coax and return on the shell of the coax. So one coax cable can actually give us a two terminal measurement on a device. And so what we get is we get an initial transient current charging the cable. At some point the current through the resistor dominates and when our voltage gets flat, all we have is the resistor current. Okay. This transient behavior is, is difficult to deal with. If you don't know what the transients of your cables are, the capacitance of your cables, it's hard to deconvolve this from your actual device. All right. That's one of the reasons that we did the remote amplifier. With the remote amplifier, we actually take this point and we put it so close to the device that our residual cable capacitance is very low and these transients become very small.
So if we wanted to do a spot mean on this resistor, we would probably pick a spot out here about this size and say this is our spot mean area. And this, of course, I uh, can't quite see the scale on that. This could be uh, um, 100 nanoseconds across here, which could be 25 nanosecond samples. By definition, our spot mean is the average of all 20 of those samples. On the other hand, we might be interested in these leading edge features here. We might really want to know what's the transient behavior of this resistor. So one of the things we can do is take the resistor out of the circuit and then all we're doing is measuring these cable charging currents and then put the resistor back in and now we can sort of deconvolve the transient behavior of the cable versus the transient behavior of the resistor. The same applies during the discharge time. But as I'm sure some of you have learned in your research, charge and discharge times aren't necessarily the same. Charge coming into something and charge coming out of something can be two different physical mechanisms. So why haven't I seen these charging current effects before in any of my testing? Well, for one reason, you might be doing fast testing with an oscilloscope. The oscilloscopes don't measure current, they just measure voltage. So you really aren't seeing the charging current in the, in the cables. If you're doing your measurements with traditional SMUs, SMUs wait until all these currents are settled. They don't measure until way out here. All right. um, most people really don't have a lot of experience with pulsed or transient waveforms. Um, in order to really see these things, you need relatively fast pulse transition times, say in the neighborhood of a microsecond or less, and most power supplies and SMUs don't have microsecond rise times on them. Okay. Now, I want to give just a quick example. I love this example because it helps define why it's so difficult to measure low currents very quickly. Is it possible to measure nanoamps in microseconds. Well, let's take a look at it. Suppose we want to do five nanoamps in a nanosecond. Calculate the number of electrons for five nanoamps during a nanosecond. Well, an amp is a coulomb per second, which is 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second. So five nanoamps would be 31 times 10 to the 9th electrons per second. But in a nanosecond, that would only give me 31 electrons. Well, it's, you know, 31 electrons, trying to measure it in a single shot with an instrument, is a pretty tough thing to do. <laughs> so, but uh, actually this particular uh, 5 nanoamps in a nanosecond violates Johnson noise. But even if it didn't violate Johnson noise, it gives you an example of, you know, we're talking very short times, which means we don't get a lot of signal to take a look at. Real quick, this is just a uh, Johnson noise curves for different resistor levels. So um, Johnson noise is caused by electrons flowing through a resistance. The voltage Johnson noise is square root of 4kT Br, and the current of Johnson noise is 4kT Br divided by the resistance. K being Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature absolute, B is the bandwidth, which for our purpose we'll define as two times the measurement window, and R is the source resistance that we're taking a look at. So if we had a 1K ohm source resistor, anything below this 1K ohm line is in the Johnson noise. We can't measure it. Let's take an example of a 10K ohm resistor. We have a 10K ohm resistor. Maybe it's the source to drain resistance of our MOSFET. And our goal is to measure the lowest possible current in 10 nanoseconds. So we take our 10K ohm line, we drop it down to 10 nanoseconds. The lowest possible current we could measure is 10 nanoamps. Now that is a Johnson noise limit. That's a fundamental limit. Doesn't mean this instrument can measure that. Doesn't mean there aren't other effects. But it does mean you'll never measure lower than that at room temperature. Okay. So if you have in your head that you're going to actually measure 10 nanoamps or less, it won't happen. 
right? Now, this instrument is probably certainly within one order of magnitude of Johnson noise limits or closer depending on some factors. So, you know, certainly a um, 100 nanoamp measurement or maybe a 20 or 50 nanoamp measurement is probably possible here. All right, that is the end of our two-day training session. I want to leave you with just a brief conclusion. The purpose of this training session was to introduce you to electrical characterization using a specific tool as example, the Keithley Model 4200 Semiconductor Characterization <coughs> System. That particular system uh, includes a wonderful reference manual, which is on CD, which can be also installed on a laptop or desktop computer. That reference manual is, I believe, in the neighborhood of 2,000 page PDF now. It also includes a variety of applications manuals, app notes for specific measurement applications, such as carbon nanotubes or solar cells or phase change memory. We include apps notes. We have our low-level measurements handbook available, which is sort of the Bible on making low-level measurements. We have LabVIEW drivers available. We have a large variety of example projects, projects for doing CV tests on MOSFETs, projects for doing a full characterization on a solar cell or a carbon nanotube FET. And we have a large variety of external instrument drivers, drivers for probe stations, cryo chambers, thermal chucks, um, external instrumentation. So all of these resources um, are available either on the instrument itself or on the Keithley website. That's the end of our training session, but we do have time. If you have a, a, a last uh, question or two, we could take another question. Yeah. So you, uh, when showing the ultra-fast IV, uh, it was mostly voltage pulses. Can you do just a hold a voltage and measure current pulses, or measure current? Right, so the question is, um, we showed voltage pulses in our pulsed IV, but can we do a voltage fixed level and then sample the current as it goes along? The answer is absolutely. We absolutely can, we can hold that voltage almost indefinitely and sample the current at a five nanosecond rate. If the device is changing its impedance, it will, the, 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 the voltage, because it has a very fast response rate, will hold up, but the current will change with it at the response rate of the current amplifiers. Okay. But what we can't do directly are current pulses. So it is a voltage source with an ammeter and a voltmeter. So um, there is a current limit capability built in, but it really doesn't do a true current pulse. But it, a, a rapid impedance change, it can... It can keep up with a rapid impedance change. That's frequent, that's what we do with a phase change memory or a resistive memory, a memristor. Um, those are very difficult devices to test. They go from high resistance to low resistance and vice versa very rapidly. Okay, thank you for your time and attention and I'd like to thank Purdue for the opportunity to give this training session and uh, good night.